Thank you. Well, hey, why don't you turn in your Bibles? We're in the book of 2 Timothy this morning in chapters 3 and a little bit of 4. We're making our way through these house rules and looking at God's house that Paul instructed Timothy as well as application for your own house and things you can take home. Because it is Father's Day, last week I, I had Jamie send around with some of the kids the things I appreciate most about my dad. And I want to read those to you, a few of them. The thing I appreciate most about my dad is he loves to spend time with us and he shares treats with us. Don't tell mom. The thing I appreciate about my dad is he's always willing to teach me even when he is busy. Way to go, Pops. The thing I appreciate most about my dad is amazing and gives me food and takes me swimming and he buys me toys. P.S. Love you, Daddy. This one takes the cake. The thing I appreciate most about my dad is he sword fights with us. Hopefully those are Nerf swords, not real ones. If so, we can talk afterwards. But how important, Dad, you are one of the greatest influencers in your kids' lives. In fact, your influence has a direct result in their character and who they become. There's a website called fatherhood.org and it gives some interesting statistics and information, but it actually lists there that children raised in a fatherless home have a greater risk of poverty, teen pregnancy, drug and alcohol abuse, behavioral problems, child abuse or neglect, and dropping out of high school. Not that these are definite uh, outcomes, but they are considerations about the importance of a father figure in the home. Now, how it relates to our text is this, is that Timothy, if you remember, Timothy, his mother and his grandmother poured into him, but in Acts 16, Timothy's father was not saved. He was a Greek. So his father was kind of out of the picture. So yeah, there's hope if you're raising a kid by yourself, mom. And so in the meantime, what happened is Paul came along and became this spiritual father figure uh, for Timothy took him into the ministry, and he calls him uh, his beloved son in chapter 1, verse 2. But he not only encouraged Timothy when he was down, as we saw last week in the first two chapters, but now he begins to instruct Timothy in, in, verses, in chapters 3 and 4, instructing him in the right way to go. Paul wants to see his son in the faith excel and do what God has called him to do. And so in chapter 3 and 4, he gives him some footsteps to follow when things are difficult and trouble is around. Like Indiana Jones, you're hunting for that treasure and you got to go through this maze and you got to step in just the right places or what's going to happen? Darts are going to hit the minister and the ministry is going to fall down. It's not going to be effective. So you got to follow those footsteps. So the house rule, we're on number 9, is that in this house... Parents, you set the example for your kids to follow. And look at how Paul does that as a spiritual father. We'll make some applications. Let's start off in verse 1 of chapter 3. But know this, Paul writes to Timothy, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. The times Paul was living in, he refers to in verse 1 as the last days, the days before Christ would return. And he says there that they are perilous times, they are difficult, they are stressful times. One uh, uh, would, would say they are uh, uh, furious times. It was a word that was used to describe a, a ravaged animal or a truly difficult storm. And in the Bible, it was used to describe a demonic man one time. And so these were definitely difficult, strenuous times. But Paul focuses not on the political temperature or the natural problems. He focuses in on what's happening with people. Socially, people will be self-centered like never before. 
rude and crude to others, blasphemous about the things of God, disobedient to parents like never before, unthankful in heart, he lists their unloving, which means without natural affection, having that family love. You've all seen where her kids are, you know, now divorcing their parents. I don't know how that works. Or, or most recently, absolute absurdity and stupidity in my mind, where a kid says, you didn't ask me if my, what I wanted to be, whether I wanted to be born in your family. And you think, <laughs> yeah, that's one of those moments, right? But they're unloving. Uh, traitors to covenants and what is good. No longer your word is, is your bond. Uh, loving pleasure and money over God. There's a hedonism and a selfishness. And so he says perils are going to come socially. And then there in verse 5, he says perils are going to come religiously. Uh, this apostasy and this falling away from the faith. There's a, a form of godliness, but they deny the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel to change a life. It's just a ritual. It's just all form. They'll go to church, they'll sing the songs, they'll even give, but they've never allowed the gospel to transform them from the inside out. And some of you say, wow, that's, that sounds a lot like today. It does. Well, what's the difference here? Well, we've always seen certain aspects of these things happening when we think about life itself. These things, in one sense, have always been happening, but in the end times, they're going to ramp up in a way like never before, even celebrated in some of these sins. Isaiah says in Isaiah 5, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And if you would look at verse 13, he says, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's what's going to happen in the end times. And if I could just kind of share with you one little thing, I was, I was just, my jaw dropped when I read this, that the IRS has now granted the Church of Satan a 501c3, a nonprofit status under the, uh, the umbrella of equality and religious rights. How far have we gotten to now we say what is absolutely demonic and a celebration of Satan himself is, eh, it's a-okay. I'm living in the last days. It's just what it is. But Paul's instruction to Timothy, note it, is very clear. He says there, pick at him. No. He says, oh, oh, go protest and, and start a hashtag movement and start these things. No, no. What does he say in verse 5? <clears throat> Stay away from them. Oh, there are, there are times that you need to stand for righteousness. But listen, the believer's life is to be characterized by I'm following Jesus. This world is not my home. Don't get bent out of shape when this world starts to get bent out of shape. Stay steady, stay strong, keep your eyes on Jesus because you know where you're going. But, but what about, what about, well, 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 hold on. You realize at times that there are times when the enemy wants to distract you from following Jesus and so he gets you caught up in everything else that's going on over here that really doesn't matter. But yeah, it really does matter because of my grant. Yeah, it does in some degree, but never to this degree. Always keep Jesus the primary focus as you go forward and walk with him. And guess what you're going to experience? You're going to experience the joy of the Lord rather than a bummed out bitterness, chaotic, troubled heart because the world is not acting like Christians. Can't expect them to. They don't know the Lord. But like a father telling his kids, Paul instructs Timothy, observe the things going on in your world, both good and bad. Discern things clearly because not every battle is for you to get involved in. Line it up with the Bible and wisely stay away from those things that will either destroy your life or sidetrack your focus. You see, I think for the believer, we got to keep three things in focus. we got to keep the purity of God's Word in focus. we got to keep the person of God's Son, Jesus, in focus. And we got to keep the prize that is to come in focus, that of heaven itself. You'll be all right sticking with those three. Verse 6 and 7, he says there that for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So these not only have a form of religion, but they trip people up with their false doctrines and their spiritual traps. They go door to door looking for those who they can kind of take advantage of and they work their way into the home with this spiritual hierarchy knowledge taking place. Who are they after? Well, first it's the gullible. 
He says there are these women. These, these women, obviously, it wasn't that he was putting down women. Women were often at home by themselves. I know a lot of gullible men as well, so it works both ways. But in this culture, they were home by themselves, and so people would come and want to talk, and it was like, hey, let's talk. But the gullible are those who are not strong in the faith, who have not laid that foundation. And so they're easily swayed. But he also says it's, they're not only gullible, they're guilt-ridden, they're burdened down with sins. And so these guys come in and they play upon the emotions and they begin to try to offer them a way apart from Jesus to appeal to their flesh that this is a higher way to go. Somebody once said, how do you spot a sheep from a wolf? And that's a terminology, if you're not familiar with, between those who know Christ and those who are out to get him. And the answer is, look at what they eat. Sheep eat grass, not each other. I think that's a simple way to look at it. In verse 8 and 9, he says, Now as Janus and Jambres, that's not a rock band, that is the two guys we'll talk about, resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as, all, as theirs also was. So Paul gives Timothy an example in history of Israel's false teachers, uh, and their end. And he goes back to the time when Israel was in Exodus. There are these two guys. They were occultic uh, magicians of Pharaoh's court who resisted the truth from Moses. You see, the Lord, to prove his authority from God, the Lord told Moses to cast down his rod and it would turn into a snake. It would be a sign of the authority. And these guys went, big deal. I can do that too. And so they did. And then Moses turned the Nile into blood. And these guys said, no problem. Counterfeit work. They did they did that as well. Moses called up frogs. These guys said, I got you covered, Kermit. And the way they went, and there was more frogs. Until finally, they could, not, they could not counterfeit that work. And in the end, it proved their folly. Their gods did not prevail. The Lord prevailed. In fact, the only thing they added to the situation was more blood, more frogs, more snakes in the people's lives. How true that is. Satan's work is powerful. But it's not true. It's not lasting. We have to be careful and watch out. So Paul tells Timothy, note the people, their ways, and their ends, and be wise. Because things will get worse before they get better. And sometimes we can think, well, do I then give up and go live in a hole because things are going to get so bad? Nope. Think about this. Sometimes in the very darkest of times, in the most difficult of days, God is doing something really great. What I found out is that the two things happen often. The believers, the believers in those difficult times, it brings out the best in the believer. It's like a pressure cooker that there it's cooking you and forming something really sweet. It's the diamond that's getting crushed. It's the oil getting crushed so that the olive is getting crushed so the oil can come. And sometimes the Lord's working in your life, building that character through those difficulties. But it not only brings out the best in the believer, it brings out the best of believers too in difficult times. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and saying, we're going to stand strong in our convictions of who God is, no matter if we're thrown in the fire or not. You see, the revivals of our land have all happened after an incredibly dark time. A new day dawns before the darkness happens, or after the darkness occurs. And so don't be discouraged and distraught because, well, what's God doing in this difficult time? Hey, he's working in you. He's going to work through you for the glory of Jesus. Keep hanging on to him. So here, following in the footsteps of faith requires a discerning mind to the times we live in, but a determined heart to stay the course. Paul tells Timothy now in verse 10 that you need to follow these three things as we move forward. These are safe steps in troubled times. Look at what he says. Number one, follow the godly example before you. Great for us to note. But you have carefully followed my doctrine manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the first thing he says here that we take home is that in difficult times, you need to follow those godly examples that are before you. Of course, Paul was, a, again, a spiritual father to Timothy. He says, follow my footsteps, Tim. Note these things. Paul's doctrine. His doctrine was Jesus risen again, salvation to all men, Jew and Gentile. 
He lived out what he believed and how important that is. Fathers, do your kids know the doctrine that you believe? Is it lived out in your life? Paul's manner of life, he's just a down-to-earth guy. If he's got to work, he's going to work. He's not above others. And dads, do you put your, this image to your kids that you're better off than others? Hopefully not. It's important that they see that real Christians are real people and have friends of all sorts. Paul's purpose, he was called to teach and preach and to bring glory to God. And dad, what, what is your purpose in life? And what are you telling your kids the purpose of life is? Is it just about money and possessions and positions and all that stuff? Or have they really seen that your purpose in life is to bring glory to your creator and to do what's uh, pleasing in his eyes? Paul's faith, notice he not only was a faith for salvation, but it was a faith from salvation. His faith was active. It was trusting God day to day. It was willing to take a risk for the king and his kingdom at times. It was ready to move as God would lead him. And oh, how important that is, dads, as we think about our sons and sons in the faith, that we say, you know what, take risks for God. Be a man of active faith, not static faith. It's not just about saying a prayer when you were a kid. It's about walking in the footsteps of faithful men in that, in that regards. Paul's long-suffering, he faced trials and prisons without losing hope, patient with people who didn't get it, willing to endure whatever that they may know Jesus. And do my kids see the long-suffering in, in my heart? Or are they more quick to note the short fuse? Number six was Paul's love. He loved Jesus, he loved his family, even at some point saying, I wish I could be cut off that all of Israel might be saved. And people knew. This guy talked more about the love of God. Sometimes he gets a bad rap, but... Read Romans 8, and you're blown away with how much he understands the love of God. And dads, again, as leaders of the family, do my kids know that I love God first and foremost, and I love them, and I would sacrifice that they might know you, Lord. They need to know those things. Paul's perseverance. He had a track record of faithfulness and steadiness. People can look and go, man, there goes a guy who is faithful. There goes a guy that's steady. There is a model to follow. And dad, if that's not, there's always room to start over because that's the heart of Jesus. Look at Paul's perseverance. Look at Paul's persecutions and afflictions that he, here's a guy who got knocked down, he got back up again. He never allowed the outward beatings and hardships to change his heart for people and for God. It's a great thing to follow. And all these things Tim knew because Tim was with him. So Timothy, listen, you understood, you saw this, you're from Iconium, that area, and Antioch and Lystra. You saw these things, you know personally what's happened. And he tells him these things because he knew Tim would face some hardships too in his own life. Note it, gang, note it, dads, what great advice to tell your kids. Your story is crucial to their story. What God has done in your life and how he shaped your character to pass it down to another kid or another son in the faith that they may be strong as God shapes their story. Be that for others. Get that from others. Your kid cannot be a godly person unless there are examples to show them how. Oh, sure, God can do, you know, the, the different things, but often he puts someone in their life to show them what it's all about, to follow in the footsteps. I think about my own dad. And man, I'm blessed. That's all I can say, I'm blessed. I've seen him pray and hurt with people, but I've seen him get ticked off and rip things apart, you know. Dad's like the Hulk at times, you know. But those are, those are inside stories you'll never know. But anyways, <laughs> that, that having that blessing is such a huge thing. It helps to shape the person. Are you in the Word, Dad? Are you in prayer? Are you in fellowship? What they see is what they get. What they see is what they get from you. And Paul says to Timothy, I want you to lean on the power because God can sustain you and I want you to learn from the promise that this is part of following him. Verse 12, he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Following the footsteps of Jesus isn't always welcomed in the world's eyes. It's going to get difficult. Persecution, though painful, can be a sign that you're actually on track with God. 
We have a tendency to think if things are wrong, something may be wrong with me and my walk with God. But have you ever thought to consider it may be perfectly fine with you and God and the enemy's just having a heyday because he doesn't like what God's doing in your life? We're quick to jump to, what's wrong, God? What have I done? And sometimes the Lord says, hey, you're A-OK. -okay. You're just going through the trial. The enemy's attacking. Hide in me. It can happen. Will there ever be a time when godly people aren't persecuted? Well, probably not until Jesus comes again. Because it's going to get worse in verse 13 as he talks about imposters and things getting worse. All that tells us is hold on tighter to the gospel. Because what God said, he's going to do. When troubles surround you, follow the footsteps of the godly examples before you. Dads, lay out a pair of shoes for your kids to grow into. And let them walk in your footsteps. But not only follow the godly examples, number two, when troublesome times happen, you need to look at the good word of God that's laid out for you. Look at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. While the world spins out of control, we stay steady in the word of God. Paul says, Timothy, you've had great examples. Your mom, your grandmother has poured into you. Others, myself, has poured into you. You have the Holy Spirit there to guide you. Hold to the truth. He says in verse 15 that they not only known the Holy Scriptures, but those Scriptures help make him wise for salvation. So what a great call as dads to be pouring into your kids those things of the Lord. Not just for a moral compass, but for uh, salvation and continued growth. And which ones, some may say, well, verse 16, all scripture. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the Greek, all means all. That's what it means. You try your best to squeeze that one apart. All means all. See, there's some today, even in the church, in Christianity today, that think, well, we don't need the Old Testament. We can just have the New Testament. But if that's all we needed, then at some point God would have said, do away with the completely the Old Testament. Don't read about it. It doesn't matter anymore. Just read the New. But God gave us all Scripture. It's inspired by God. The Old Testament paints us a picture of the coming Messiah and all the things that point to Jesus. The New Testament points us back to Jesus and how to live the Christian life. To understand the greatness of the New Covenant, you've got to at times read the Old Covenant and see what you are under. But God says all scripture is needful to be taught. Old Testament, New Testament, the whole thing. All scripture is God breathed is what it literally is. And it's needful. Scripture is not only needful, he says there that it's profitable. There's a valuable gain in these four areas. It's profitable for doctrine. What's doctrine? It's the understanding of who God is what my purpose in life is, what my end goal is, what this thing called sin that has really done to me, those type of things. The Bible has answers for man. It's profitable for reproof, which is to rebuke or censor. When we sin, it's the scriptures that tell us where we went off and it cuts us like a knife, Hebrews 4.12 says, and tells us what's wrong so that then we can deal with it rightly before God. He doesn't want us to be tripped up by sin. He wants us to walk in new life. It's profitable for correction, it says there. Not just telling us our failures, but showing us how to be forgiven and set right and to go forward with the Lord. And it's profitable for instruction in righteousness, how to live to please God, to watch out for the traps and to stay focused on Jesus. That, verse 17, the man of God may be complete or competent to useful want to grow up to maturity in Christ and be used by the Lord for whatever ministry he may call you to. So don't neglect the word of God and the importance of it in your life on a daily basis. Dads, parents, people, how important is the word? The last thing he gets them in trouble sometimes, you have to hang on to the examples before you, the good word of God to you, and lastly, this grand charge at the beginning of chapter 4, this grand charge given to Timothy that I believe is given to all of us. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. 
Stop right there for a moment because this is a serious sit down. This is like a father saying, son, we got to talk. He says, in light of all these things happening, in light of what's taking place, and you need to understand these things, I charge you. And the word is a military term. It's an ordering from a commander to a soldier. I charge you. Give me your attention. Give me your focus. Do this completely. Finish this fact. And, and, and he even says, in the, in the witness of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you can't go any higher than that, that this is the authority and he says there, preach the word, verse 2. Preach the word, proclaim it. And Paul elevates the importance for every church and every place to preach the word personally, publicly, how important that is. We never get to a point where we don't need the preaching and teaching of the word of God. It's what God wants for God's people, for God's glory. We need to have that. Unfortunately, there are some churches out there that don't preach or teach the Word of God. They'll share good morals. They'll talk about chicken soup for the soul stuff or nice how to fix your life. And it's all dealing with the outward. And they never get to the, what God intended for His church to clearly how to live because God's intention, verse 17 of chapter 3, was that we may grow up and be equipped for good works. And how important we need the word. Someone once said, if man needed an entertainer, God would have sent a comedian. If he just needed instruction, God would have sent him an educator. If he just needed enlightenment, God would have sent him a guru. If he needed a political leader, God would have sent him one. What man needs is to be saved, and so God sent us a savior. And true, that is. And he tells Timothy not only to preach the word, but be ready in season and out of season. That means at any time, when God opens the door, be ready to share the hope that lies within you, Tim. He says to convince, which means of, the, of convincing them of sin, bringing it to light. To rebuke or admonish and charge them. To exhort means to call near and encourage and invite them in with long suffering because you got to have patience with people and teaching them. So preach the word is the command, be ready is the preparation, and the convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering is the work to do. Why? Well, look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Paul had seen the shadows of this and says, Tim, I want you to note what's coming down the road. People won't endure sound doctrine. They'll say, oh, that's just old-fashioned. We don't need to hear about those things. It's not needed. I just want to hear messages that appeal to my flesh and my things and stuff like that. And, and again, I think when you apply the Word of God to your life, you have to apply it practically. You have to make it relevant, but you cannot discard sound doctrine because your actions are directly connected to what you believe. If I said, hey, you know what, I believe in the laws of aerodynamics and such, I'm going to get into this plane, and I believe that this plane and that law is going to keep me from falling to the ground from 30,000 feet as gravity is still trying to pull me down. I believe in that law of thermodynamics, so I have no problem stepping on a plane. Aerodynamics. But if I say, you know what, I really believe the law of gravity is far greater than that law, so I am not stepping on that plane, you're belief dictates your actions. And so it's true in the same way with the Lord, that in a sense what you believe about him is going to settle you to rest in who he is and his promises and his ways to go, you know, I don't have to worry about falling because my God is greater than that law in particular. And he's dealt with it so I can rest and enjoy my journey with him. What you believe is going to dictate how you act. So sound doctrine is of great importance. He says there that they have itching ears, or it really is tickling ears. They're looking for someone to tell them and what to hear, how pleasant it is. They're looking for somebody to flirt with them, to flatter and flirt with them. And my ears kind of itch, you know? Oh, you're such a nice guy. You hear sometimes from the pulpit. You're the greatest. Oh, that, that, that problem you're facing, that's not really a problem. That's not really an issue. You just look in the mirror and tell yourself you're a winner. Huh? 
And people go, that kind of felt good. Yeah, I like this thing called church. But the reality is you don't need man's opinions. You need God's word. And sometimes God's word says, hey, I'm going to poke you in the eyes and then I'm going to wrap my arms around you and let you know that you're still loved. I'm going to tell you that there's sin there and you've got to deal with it. And that, yeah, we've all failed. But guess what? We serve a mighty God who's been faithful to bring us a Savior. And he can do the work. Be in his word and you'll get to know. Studying the Bible gives us this clear and uh, discernment between things that are myths and things that are truth. Look at verse uh, uh, 4 there as he goes on and he says, and they will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. Fables are myths. Myths. When we're in the Word and studying it, it equips us to be able to discern things rightly. You want to know a couple myths that have floated in through the church? I'll give them to you. Here's a couple of them. Uh, a, a, a myth. How about this one? God helps those who help themselves. That's from Benjamin Franklin, not the Bible. Here's another myth. God won't give you more than you can handle. You realize that's not in the Bible? Oftentimes God does give you more than you can handle so that you lean into him and see his power and there's a testimony at work there for him to hold you up. Because if God didn't give you more than you can handle, you would lie upon your own strength and you wouldn't need God. So he often does do that. But we think it's more comforting to say, oh, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. How about this one? God wants you to be rich and prosperous. Hey, your riches and prosperity are in heaven, not this earth. And another myth, well, if you just believe it, it will happen. God is not a genie in a bottle and we're not living out Aladdin here. We trust the Lord. He's in control. It's not to get my will, it's His will. Or whatever that may look like. But studying the Word of God is going to give us discernment with these things to not be swayed by all these myths and things. And you know, there's sometimes, I remember one time in Bible college, we were sitting down and this, this buddy of mine was thinking, oh, should I date this girl? I said, man, let's just take the Bible and let's just open it up and see what verse. You ever seen people do that? This is God's will. It's like a magic eight ball. Shake it up and whatever happens. And he pointed to this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that we talked about, verse 9. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifested to all. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Crazy times. But when you're in the Word of God and you're just studying it through, you get to know the heart of God and the plan of God and you rest in His promises and His will and Man, it's just such a joy. When life happens, it just is what it is. You're not freaking out because you don't understand it. You just trust the Lord who's over it all. And he's promised you heaven. This life is so short. Why do we get so caught up in this brief breath, thinking that's all there is, when God says, hey, you've got eternity with me? Isn't that a cool thing? And at times we've got to stop and take a breath in the midst of our troubles and trials and say, Lord, I've got eternity with you. Bring it on. The sooner the better. He says in verse 5 as we close out, But you, Timothy, you're a different guy. You're different because of Christ. Be watchful or be on guard for the traps. Endure the sufferings and afflictions that are associated with being a Christian. Do the work of an evangelist. That is, share the gospel with others when God opens the door. Fulfill your ministry. Don't be so caught up with, Lord, what are you going to do with that guy? No, no, no. Lord, what do you want to do with me? Fulfill the ministry you've called me to do. I want to be faithful in that. Listen, if we are to follow the footsteps of faith, we not only need to hear the truth, we need to adhere to it. We need to lay out a course for our households that is observant of the surroundings and careful with our steps. That we walk in a way that honors God, upholds His Word, and opens up the door to witness and share the love of Christ with others. Is this the example we set for others to follow? And last question is this. What kind of footprints are you leaving in your home? What kind of footprints? Your kids go, those are dad's shoes. I've seen them before. I'm going to walk in those. Mm -hmm.